So who are we? I'm Ren. And I'm Don. And this is Books in Sight, where hopefully you'll get a little bit of insight into books. Uh, we decided it'd be kind of fun to play a little game of two truths and a lie. Fiction slash literature slash bookish edition. Now, Dee, because you were a little bit more prolific in your production of these sets, I will let you go first. So if you've never played the game, he's going to read three ostensible facts related to books in some way, and I have to guess which one is not true. So would it, would it work for if anybody's watching this at hmm. some point to just pause after the after yes, the reading? The you answer, should guess. The yeah. answer's good. Okay. Mm -hmm. So then D, I'll have you read all three and then I'll take a guess. Okay. It might be hard to keep everything in your mind, but here we go. Okay. Um, these are three books, and I'm going to tell you the famous book and then mm. tell you what it was going to be called before mm. they fixed it. Okay. You have to know which one is not true. Okay. Dracula mm -hmm. was going to be called The Undead. Okay. Gravity's Rainbow was going to be called Mindless Pleasures. Mm. 1984 was going to be called Two plus two equals five. Because I know you, I'm going to assume that the gravity's rainbow one is true because that seems too specific to not be true since you've read that book so recently. So I'm going to say that it's either the Dracula or the 1984 one. Uh, I can reread them if you didn't, if you don't remember what I said. No, I think I got it. So it's either the undead instead of Dracula or two plus two equals five for 1984. <laughs> I'm going to say, to not belabor the point, I'm going to say, I think that, well, it's hard because I feel like the undead, it could be, but I'm not sure if they were using that experience at the time that that was written yet because it sounds like it could be now but if that wasn't in use at the time then it wouldn't make sense and then two plus two equals five thematically would make sense for 1984 but then I could also see why they wouldn't want to do that because it's clunky but then they didn't do that so maybe it was but then they didn't because that's clunkier than just 1984 but I'm, I'm gonna my impulse is to say that the 1984 one is not true. You are correct. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Okay. Good job. Points for me. All right. And then I'll give you one. Point. All right. Um, so for my first set, all three questions are about the novel Moby Dick. So the first one is, that the true story behind the novel of Moby Dick involved cannibalism. The second one is that Nabokov co-authored the screenplay for the 1956 film. And the third one is that the novel was dedicated to Nathaniel Hawthorne. Hmm. Well, the first and third sound likely. Hmm. To me, more likely than Nabokov writing the screenplay. Mm. So, so, you, say, so I think number two is not true. And that is true. However, do you know who did co author the screenplay? Mm, 1956? Yeah. Mm. It is kind of odd if you didn't know this. Faulkner? Mm -mm. Ray Bradbury. Oh, wow. Okay. I'm not even sure Faulkner was alive then, but okay. Um, way to go, way to go, Ray. Yeah. Go, I don't even remember. Um, anyway, okay. Well, I I lucked out on that one. I, just, yeah. I, I, just I think, I, I, think I knew about the cannibalism vaguely and the other one, what was this? What was the third one again? Oh, that it was dedicated to Nathaniel Hawthorne. Okay, I know that, that, that he really esteemed Hawthorne tremendously, so. 
I didn't even know they knew each other, but I was reading about it. And I, I, yeah, I didn't realize that they were such good buddies or that they lived so close to each other that that was why I guess they knew each other. Maybe yeah, it seemed like Melville was like really seeking Hawthorne's approval for what he mm. was doing. You know? And then now I would say Melville outshines Hawthorne. I would uh, agree. Although Hawthorne's brilliant and he did a lot of good stuff, but. I, only, I think I've only ever read a Scarlet Letter, the Scarlet Letter by yeah. Hawthorne. I didn't really like I didn't really like that one, to be honest with you, not be, for any particular reason that stands out in my memory. I just don't remember finding it very compelling or shocking or interesting in any way. No, I, I read that in high school or sometime mm -hmm. and I was sort of impressed or interested in the language of it, mm. but not. I mean, the story seemed I, especially that premise you know being used so many millions of times if somebody's you know like hypocritical mm. there you know and somebody else suffers for it in some way rather than you know yeah i don't know i just to me the whole thing i think it was probably largely because i was pretty familiar with the general outline of the story before we read the novel and so it just seemed like there was not to me other than I guess the language, which I, I think I was too young when I read it to maybe even be thinking about how it was written. It was more like, what is the story? And I was like, well, yeah. I kind of already know the story. So yeah. I don't feel like I need to read this. Like I understand the moral. I understand like the social comment. I just, I don't know. But I didn't care for it. But it is interesting in any case that Melville liked him so much <laughs> that he yeah, dedicated. I didn't know. Him. Hawthorne was really firmly established. Mm -hmm. And, you know, was a, uh, and, and I think Melville was a little, not, I don't know, flighty is not the right word, but like mm. unsure of his mm. genius or something. But I think he was the greater mm. genius. Well, you, I know you, did you read Moby Dick or did you listen to the audio book? I think you listened to the audio book. Oh, I, I read it. Oh, you did read it. Okay. Yeah. Somebody listened to the well, audio A while back. I mean, I, I would certainly read it again. I love mm. that remark, you know, like if a book's worth reading, it's worth reading again. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I with that agree. one, oh, yeah, well, with that one in particular, like, I, because I just watched the documentary about the behind the, the behind the scenes, no, the, the, the true story um, oh, yeah. behind that, that was why that was in my mind, because Ask a Mortician did a documentary about it on YouTube, and I was, like, honestly surprised, because nothing about the, as far as I understand, nothing about the true story even makes it into the novel other than the fact that the boat was wrecked by the whale right like nothing none of the other stuff had anything to do with the plot i don't think so i i know there was a book about it by a young adult author named philbrick who summarizes the background story behind it mm. um i can't remember i think i looked through that book and maybe that's why i wish knew about the cannibalism or something but um yeah. there was no, a lot no, of no himself had had a weird experience that led to some of the content too, because he, if I'm not mistaken, what was in a either a shipwreck or he he abandoned a ship for some reason or other and lived among cannibals for a while, which seems like what? You know, but I'm pretty sure that was true of himself. Oh, that should have been one of my other points, except you would have to double check it because that seems a little redundant given that that was what happened. <laughs> Yeah, maybe you might be because like there, uh, at least in her documentary, she talked about how the crew got separated into three different, not lifeboats, but like littler boats. And oh. one of and at one point they passed by stopping on an island where they would have not been stuck in the boats, at least in her, according to her research, that because they were afraid that the natives on the island were cannibals and they did not want to be eaten. So they did not stop <laughs> on the island. The irony, of course, being that then they ate each other on the boats. Yeah, okay. So Yeah, yeah the, the, the thing that's in the back of my mind, it may or may not be correct about Melville having spent some time with the cannibal tribe, mm. how not, you know, it was okay, you know, until he left. Um, it isn't the same as having it happen on board a ship because you're out of food. So I, it could still be true. Whatever, whatever I had that in my yeah. head. Anyway. Well, well in any well, case, I'm glad that he survived either yeah. that true experience or not. <laughs> yeah, the book I did just read of his was The Confidence Man, uh, which was a very late book, a very strange mm -hmm. book. Was and, it? I think it's kind of short, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, compared well, I'll certainly compared to Moby Dick. Yeah, it's like two hundred and fifty pages or something like that. 
That's interesting because I just picked up a copy of that kind of on a whim because I recognized his name, obviously. I've never, I've not read Moby Dick, but I kind of was happy to have something shorter because I thought maybe I would start with that and see if I liked his style. But I, but do you think it's not characteristic of him, that one? Uh, I'm not really sure. Um, um, did he write Bartleby the Scrivener? Yeah, that I have that one too. Oh, that's right. Okay. Did you read that? No, but I got it for the same reason. I think I got them at the same time. Okay, I would, I would, I would not push the confidence man on somebody mm. unless they already know they like Melville because it's weird. I mean, it's it's very it's very uh, the sentences are really strangely put together, sort of like Proust and other writers who have oh. very convoluted, long things. To me, that worked really well in Moby Dick. Confidence Man is just an intriguing, but it's not as much fun or whatever you want to call it. So that will not be making any go with Bartleby the Scrivener. Read Bartleby the Scrivener and see if you have any interest in Melville in, at all. Okay. Yeah, and that one's even shorter. So I love that for me. <laughs> I just uh, I just read an essay by Thomas Pynchon hmm. about sloth or sloth. Sloth, I guess you say. Oh, like the sin? Yeah. Oh, he... Okay. he I don't know if he was in charge of it or not, but there was a project to have a bunch of writers each pick a quote, you know, deadly sin or mm -hmm. sin, whatever, you know, mortal sin uh, and write about it. And Pynchon, having had a character named Tyrone Slothrop, it seemed like really appropriate that he would pick Sloth. But he brought up Bartleby the Scrivener in the course of that essay, which, huh. might, which is why it came back to my mind. But. That's a see the things you learn. <laughs> Authors were involved in all sorts of shenanigans. Actually, when we're finished with the game, I'll tell you one that I didn't pick because I think I've mentioned it before and I wasn't sure if you'd remember or not, but maybe I should have. All right, your turn. Oh yeah. Who did not win the Nobel Prize? John Steinbeck, F. Scott Fitzgerald, Ernest Hemingway. Nobel Prize in Literature, obviously. Mm -hmm. John Steinbeck, F. Scott Fitzgerald, Ernest Hemingway. I feel like I should know the answer to this because I just read a biography of Hemingway last year. <laughs> and obviously he and Fitzgerald had an interesting relationship. So I feel like... That'll come up in another question I have. Oh, okay. Well, I might have a little insight into that. Although now I have said that. So if I get it wrong, it'll be doubly embarrassing. Um... I'm going to say that Hemingway did not, because I feel like I would remember that. Wrong. Really? He did? He got a Nobel Prize? At, well, okay, well, yeah, here the we person go. who didn't was F. Scott Fitzgerald. Oy. I knew it was one of them, though, because I was like, that's too perfect, because they had that weird relationship that one of them would and one of them wouldn't. I was so sure it was Hemingway, because I felt like I would have remembered that from the well, biography. I'm going to give you I'm going to give you my other Hemingway of Fitzgerald okay. thing on my next year. It's pretty, mm. pretty strange. OK. OK. Well, do you actually I think you have one more than I do anyway, like set. So if you want to give me that now. Yeah, give go ahead. Yeah. OK. Which of these statements isn't true? Mm. Agatha Christie had a degree in archaeology. Okay. Hemingway examined Fitzgerald's penis in a bathroom. Uh-huh. And Ezra Pound fed stray cats in Rapallo, Italy. I'm <laughs> very sure, and I'm going to regret saying this again, I'm very sure Hemingway did indeed do that with F. Scott Fitzgerald, because I there was something with that. That sounds familiar to me, so I'm going to say that's true. <laughs> Even though that sounds absurd, but I, I'm I'm almost positive that's true. Okay, well, I'm, I'm, also, I'm also almost positive that Agatha Christie did have the archaeology degree. That for some reason also sounds familiar. And what was the third one? Ezra Pound fed stray cats in Rapallo, Italy. Oh, but that could be too. <laughs> <laughs> the strange grouping of ideas. Yeah. Um. Well, shoot, that makes me wonder if maybe the Agatha Christie thing isn't true, because the thing with the cats, absolutely. Although then again, y'all have all those cats over there. So maybe you thought, I'll write one about cats. But then maybe you thought of it because you have all the cats and it is true. 
I'm going to say, okay, first of all, just put me out of my misery for this one. The, the Hemingway thing, that's true. Yes. Yes. Okay. I, I was like, I, okay. So I can't remember <laughs> that he won the <laughs> literature, but I do Fitzgerald, remember that. Fitzgerald was, had an argument or a issue with his wife and he thought he was uncomfortable about whether he was manly enough or whatever. And he asked Hemingway to check out his equipment. <laughs> Yeah, their whole relationship. And, was and Hemingway told him he was fine <laughs> for whatever reason. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, their whole up and down. Sure how far the examination. I, I, you know, you would think that they would stay friends forever after that. Cause like if you trust somebody to that extent, you would think nothing would tear you apart. And yet yeah. that whole friendship didn't end well for them. Uh, okay. I'm going to. Oh, wait, I'm going to say Ezra Pound did not feed the stray cats. That's my guess. No, that wasn't the one. Dang it. I, it was the, Agatha Christie. Agatha Christie didn't go to school. Or really? At least, at least she didn't have any degree. But her husband was an archaeologist. Oh. And that might have been in the back of somebody's mind. That's why I thought, it, That's I made up the part about archaeology. I mean, oh. I picked that one because she has books set in the Middle East with archaeology behind him, and her knowledge would have come from the fact that her husband was an archaeologist, I think. I think that was why I thought that might be true. Not because I knew anything about her husband, but just because it's, it, it, it wouldn't seem outrageous to me that somebody who writes, I, I don't know why I have this idea of a correlation, but like, I feels like it could be correct that a person who's interested in archaeology would also be interested in writing mysteries. I just think because there's something there, there must be some sort of intrigue in the like in history and understanding like events. Yeah. If you oh, have yeah. an interest in archaeology, oh, yeah. and I just I, feel like that would follow over into it. So that's super interesting. That very true. I think Penelope Fitzgerald wrote a mystery novel for her husband, huh. and it, I think it revolved around something about a museum and mm. archaeological exhibit. I can't really remember off the top of my head, but I can't remember why she did. But yeah, it, it does seem reasonable to me because it's sort of you're you're solving a mystery by digging up stuff and proving or disproving things about the past mm -hmm. so, yeah. well because well, it seems like that's kind of how a mystery works but like you're on the other end of it so like with the, if you write a mystery you have to know the answer in the first place and work your way backwards but if you're right. interested in archaeology it's the other way around you're the detective all of a sudden yeah, but yeah. it just yeah, it seems like there's some sort of there should be some sort of correlation there. So, yeah, but she never had a degree in anything. No, I don't think. I, the the thing I read about her somewhere said mm. she didn't go to school. I'm not sure if they meant college or if they meant mm. self educated Schools. or or what. I'll have to I'll have to look into that a little more. I hope. Or it's further hope investigation. Have, right. I have to do a little archaeological digging on that one. <laughs> All right, so for my next set, oh, I had a bonus thing about the, I forgot about this. I had a bonus fact about the Moby Dick, but I didn't pick this because I feel like this is fairly well known, but maybe somebody doesn't know it. I I didn't know, I couldn't remember what book it was, but I did know this, um, that Starbucks is named oh. after a character in Moby Dick. Yeah, Starbucks is the first mate. Yeah, I just thought that was an interesting Pequod. fun fact. Yeah. yeah I, didn't so, know, I didn't know that that's, for sure where they got it from but that's i mean in my mind yeah. there was a connection but i just thought it might be a coincidence i didn't know that was why i didn't pick it because i was like i knew you i know you've read the book so i was like well even if you didn't know that you would know that character so that would make sense <laughs> that would be the thing but i yeah the article that i read about it was they were originally going to name the shop why they were doing this was the part i wanted to know but i never oh. figured out what the interest in moby dick was why they were naming it after anything to do with moby dick when it's coffee, I have no idea. But originally they were going to name the company after the ship, but then some, they were kind of like talking it over and they're like, honestly, that word just doesn't sound as attractive. The name of the ship is- Pequod. <laughs> yeah. They were just like, I don't know if people would want to buy coffee from a place called Pequod. Yeah, so they, they ended up going with uh, Mr. Starbuck instead, which I thought was- Probably better choice. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's kind of a cool sounding word, you know, Starbuck. I never knew that because I I knew there was some literary connection, but I I never investigated it, and I always thought Starbucks is one of those words that sounds like it was engineered to be the name of a company because it's like oh, bucks like money, 
and then like star like it's like the fancy one yeah. but i never but i also somewhat knew that it had something to do with a literary connection but i never i guess i never cared enough to chase it up and i've never read moby dick so i wouldn't have even known that that was what it was hmm. but the the other thing that i heard about starbucks was with the logo now this i'm less sure if it's true or not because i never chased this up but that the logo was originally i think it's actually a mermaid possibly, okay but they cut off the bottom part of the picture okay yeah i didn't yeah, know like that the original yeah. picture was bigger and either it was a mermaid, there was something kind of weird with it where either it was a mermaid or it was like some other kind of mermaid-like creature, but it had two tails. There's something weird about the design of this where I'm confused okay. about that. But yeah, that the original logo picture was much bigger and they just cut it to be the top half. That's still, that's still it's kind of consistent with, you know, the sea and shipping, mm -hmm. and whales. And I want to know though, does anybody know why it was like, there was this connect, I guess whoever the founder was must just have liked that book. I, I can't think of any other reason why they would have been connecting the idea of a coffee shop with Moby Dick otherwise. Yeah. yeah. But I remember once when I was in San Francisco, uh, I was actually right outside of City Lights Books, a famous book mm. shop run by um, Lawrence Ferling Getty, a beatnik. Mm. You know, anyway, I, some, I was, they had like uh, some books out on the sidewalk and I was looking at it or something and a guy kind of came up to me and just said, I, I don't remember exactly what he said, but it was sort of like, he was like a weird, wizened old geezer. Mm. <laughs> uh, he said something like, you know, you know, follow the whale, you know, some some, some weird reference to Moby Dick. And it's like, just like, read that book, you know, whatever. I said, okay. But you did. <laughs> <laughs> but it was just one of those things that would happen in San Francisco in the 19, I guess it was early 70s at that point. Huh. Yeah, I, I, something about bookstores, I think I was actually talking to somebody about this recently where it was like, there's something about being in a bookshop or sitting somewhere reading a book that seems to invite people to like speak to you, which seems counterintuitive because a book is sort of like a private experience. Right, you're, right. you're, you're absorbed yourself. in the book, supposedly. Sort of like nowadays people have their earphones. Yeah. Like, what? What did you say? They pull yeah, yeah, yeah. Out. I feel that way about books, but there is something about being around books that seems to invite that kind of attention as well, whether, you know, you're interested in it or not, which sometimes I think I am. Like if I'm at a bookshop, especially, I'm not in the middle of reading something. I'm totally open. Like, and I've had that happen many times where I'm like just looking at something and then somebody else will come over and they'll make some suggestion or they'll like point at something yeah. and be like, oh, you should read this or and I think that's yeah. kind of a cool interactive thing. But I, the I, Yeah, I think um, there was somebody... Uh, had a list somewhere of like the most likely mm. places to meet your spouse. Mm. Number one was on the job, like, you know, a, a colleague at work. Number mm. two was the bookstore. Well, that is indeed, I suppose, the plot overarchingly of If on a Winter's Night at Traveler. So, yeah, yeah. Evito knew, Calvino knew. Right, right. <laughs> I, yeah, that's, that's, I, I can see that though. I, that's such a cool story. Can you imagine? I mean, like, I know that wasn't the case for either of us, but that would be very cute. Like, oh, where did you meet your partner? Oh, we met at a bookshop. Like, it just sounds <laughs> delightful. I don't know. Well, it sort of, it sort of opens up a aspect of each other. Mm. It's pretty important, you know, if you're book, book lovers, mm. that's probably going to be important in your life, you know, to a degree. Mm -hmm. um, or, I mean, if you met somebody at a baseball game, it might suggest that you're both going to be rapidly interested in sports for the rest of your lives, but it could just be, you know, I my, you know, I, I just happen to be here and it's just not what I normally do, or I don't know. Whereas a bookstore would be sort of like, why would you go in there if you're not interested in books? But, yeah. I don't know. Don't underestimate the sports fans. I have done that many times and I have been wrong about it many times. <laughs> no, you're probably right. That's that's a big thing in a lot of people's lives, more than it is in mine. Definitely more than it is in mine. I Kendrick and I joke about that because he is both a reader, but also like a sports fan. Not that you can't be both, but for some reason, I never really put those together. <laughs> I don't know why. I guess because sports is such a social thing and book rereading is usually not and so I just sort of have that idea of like oh yeah the more introverted like person would be the book reader and you would have to be a more social extroverted person to be interested in sports neither one of which is really true but somehow they seem like very separate spheres yeah, to me yeah. but all right so my next set involves 
Charles Dickens. So all of them are about Dickens. Oh. Mm. And again, these, now that I'm reading them back, <laughs> I feel like they're not as <laughs> interesting as yours. But anyway, let's go. All right. All right. So I, number one, uh, Nabokov specifically deeply admired the work of Charles Dickens and wrote about and spoke about him very often. Uh, two, Dickens was a founding member of the Cambridge Ghost Club, which was later patronized by Yeats and Sassoon. Mm -hmm. And number one, David Copperfield is the top rated Dickens book on Goodreads. Hmm. Well, I, I have an instant reaction and instead of trying to double think it and mm -hmm. sort of, through, I'm just going to go with my reaction. Mm -hmm. I don't... For some reason, I don't think Nabokov would like Dickens. I may be way out of whack on that, but that's what I'm going to say that that's not true about Nabokov liking Dickens. Eh. That is true. Oh, it is true. Yeah, I read like a couple of essays, not that Nabokov wrote, but about Nabokov and his love of Charles Dickens. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so he like referenced, so there is this quote that was particularly good. I should have written the whole quote down, but it was something along the lines of like, I wish I could dedicate... It was like 30 or 40 minutes of every lecture to talking about Charles Dickens, but like we can't do that every time. Oh, well, that's cool. I, I, mean, yeah. I, like the, I like the idea that, it's, that he did like him because I mm -hmm. like Dickens to be defended. I, <laughs> I, just didn't think, I just didn't think Nabokov would find him to his taste. Huh. Yeah, no, he does. Although, do you know, do you know who really, really apparently disliked not Dickens, but because I was going to do this as, oh, wait, hang on, did I choose that as the thing? Oh, yeah, no, I can't tell that. Never mind. That comes up later. So, yeah, that's true. Um, so then oh, you G have. Hmm? Well, G.K. Chesterton, the uh, essayist mostly, who also wrote mm -hmm. Father Brown stories and some other stuff. Uh, he was a big proponent of mm -hmm. Dickens and was in the minority in his generation. By and large, people thought Dickens was, you know, a good novelist for children or whatever, or he, he wrote for, a, you know, a penny a word or whatever. He was not really a brilliant stylist. I happen to think he is, and I like I liked Dick, I like Chesterton's take on him. Mm -hmm. I just, I just, anyway, I, I, it's interesting to know about Nabokov. So I was I, really surprised by that too. Actually, I was surprised to the degree that I was, I was so sure you were going to know that because I also know you had like Nabokov because I just seemed like one of those things where I was like, oh, I feel like somebody who knows anything about Nabokov must know this. But like, yeah, yeah, yeah I was I kind have, of surprised a, too. He's I have so a couple cute. of books of his that were, were his, were his lectures mm. on, there are two volumes. One is all on Russian writers and the mm. other is on writers in general, not, not Russian, mostly American and Brit and European or whatever. Mm -hmm. I've looked into him a little bit and I, I bet there's one in there that just says, Dickens, I love him. And I just never noticed it. <laughs> yeah, I, I, well, it surprised me mostly just because Nabokov, when I think of him, because I've read a few like essayized versions of lectures that he's given, not very many, but a few. And he just seems like uh, he was such an super critical person yeah. when it came to like other people's writing that I was surprised that there was anybody that he liked other than himself <laughs> a little bit never mind Charles Dickens specifically but I was like how odd that of all of the other people he would be like yeah that one <laughs> I think I read I read an essay on Dickens not long ago I can't remember who wrote it it seems like it was George Orwell which seems mm -hmm. off the wall but I think that's who it was anyway whoever it was was basically saying Dickens isn't really a great author, but mm -hmm. he somehow has this magical ability to capture uh, capture things mm -hmm. and blow us out of the water. And you, you know, so it's sort of like yeah. almost contradictory, almost like saying, "I don't know how he does it," you know, or something like that. Or he's, he's be like saying, "Everything tells me this guy should not be a very good basketball player, and yet he keeps winning games." Like, what the hell? You know? <laughs> he keeps so, winning games. <laughs> Yeah, I I don't know. Yeah, because I guess I guess it's just also because Dickens specifically, as you said, was kind of considered lowbrow, like in his day, like yeah. lowbrow art. And and to me, the idea of of yeah, Nabokov specifically championing something that would have been considered lowbrow art just seems counter to what I thought I knew about him as a critic. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that was a good one. I'm glad you told me that. I'll, I'll look into that further. I'm just curious yeah. if, what he says about Dickens. I'd be curious. 
Yeah. So then you have two more choices. So then, well, actually, I guess I'll just tell you. So then the thing that is not true is David Copperfield is not his top rated work on Goodreads. Great expectations? Or no, I actually was super shocked by which one it was, which is why I picked this question, because I thought there's no shot that that I that you would guess this. It was oh, our mutual friend. Oh, that's really weird. And okay. And not only that, I actually wrote down by what margin it was, or not by what margin, but by what, how many points it had. So Goodreads is a five point system oh, okay. and our mutual friend has 4.09, which is oh. his highest rated novel on that site. Okay. And David Copperfield was number two. Okay, interesting. That was, a, that was a clever way to come up with a false one. Well, this is why I told you I screwed myself up because I did a couple that were like that, but then I realized I made them all false. <laughs> Yeah, my temptation, my temptation was finding some things that I thought were odd. Yeah, I wrote them all down. I go, wait a minute, they're all true. <laughs> well, I got to, I've got to fudge one of these, you know. Yeah, but then the other thing was is that I thought was interesting was that he was the founding member of this Cambridge Ghost Club yeah, thing. Yeah, I only went with, I only let that go by because I think I remember him being into ghosts a bit in some regard. Yeah, that's oh, what I was oh, reading oh, about, because which was surprising because like the article that I read about it was from, I think it was just, like the Charles Dickens house, maybe. Um, but anyway, they put out this article and they were talking about how it, it was something that even his friends thought was very odd because he was so skeptical about everything and was like always trying to find like true answers to like supposedly supernatural things. But yeah, he was in this. However, they did say that in this club, a lot of it was about trying to find a rational explanation for ghostly occurrences and yet okay. he participated in a number of seance situations mm -hmm. never as the one who was like on the hot seat i guess but he was like involved in Observer, these seances. And, yeah. yeah and i thought that was super funny because i was like I, I feel like there is a part of all people who are very skeptical realists who yeah, still yeah. harbor some kind of like well it would be cool if. Yeah, that, there's that side of it. And then there's the side where the person's there as a observer, sort of. Yeah. And then then they're like very skeptical. And the person who's conducting it says, I'm getting really bad vibes <laughs> from somebody at the table here. You know, it's like they kind of, they know that that person is against them. And then they mm -hmm. discredit the whole situation saying, like, no, I don't think it's going to work today because somebody's interfering with the way of, you know, the... Mm -hmm. So, I mean, as a skeptic, you know, you, you feel the, you, you don't get the result. You don't get the outcome you're looking for, which is some sort of thing that can be questioned. Instead, nothing really happens because the person says, I'm, it's not going to work today. I'm sorry, everyone. There's some disbeliever at the table that's throwing off the, the mojo. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I guess I kind of fall into that category a little bit where I, I find the idea of those types of things so fascinating. And I, a part of, I definitely am one of those people who are a part of me is like, I don't really believe any of this, but I kind of wish that I did because I feel like life would be more fun <laughs> if you could be into something like that unironically. Yeah, yeah. One of the books I'm going to recommend mm. um, uh, dabbles on the fringes of that. Uh, with um, a, with a, an interest in the inexplicable things that seem tempting to believe. So I'll tell you about that later. All right. Well, I think it's your turn. <laughs> okay. I got another. One of these is not true as the draft title for a book that has a famous title, as it turns out. Okay. But I mean, in other words, what what it might have been titled if somebody hadn't changed it mm -hmm. before it got published. So I'll tell you the famous book that we know mm -hmm. by this name and then what it was going to be called if it didn't get altered. Okay. Great Gatsby was going to be called High Bouncing Lover. Okay. Lord of the Flies, Lord of the Flies was going to be called Strangers from Within. Huh. And Catcher in the Rye was going to be called A Bite of the Apple. Uh, I hate Catcher in the Rye. Um, mm -hmm. 
Whoops, I can run it by you again if you want. Can't tell me the Great Gatsby one again. High Bouncing Lover. Okay, that's so stupid and absurd. I'm going to assume that's true. Is that true? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I refuse to believe that you came up I with was that. afraid that that would be the outcome. You would just go, are you kidding me? That's absurd. <laughs> I get that. Hi, I, I, I told I, somebody at work and they're saying, maybe that was an expression back then that it isn't anymore, but. What as it hell? shouldn't be. That's <laughs> terrible. Oh my God. No, whoever chose Great Gatsby instead, you know, props oh. to them. Cause like, hi, geez. Yeah, it is okay. funny how, how, how uh, I actually have a list that I didn't get to use everything because I did get into this question of what would have this, what would this mm. have been called? And, you know, oh, I, I almost did one of those two out of curiosity. And then I'll get back to your question. Did on your list, did you have um, Fahrenheit 451? Uh, I don't think so. Oh, because I, I almost used this, but then I couldn't think of a category for this was it was originally going to be called the fireman, but then oh, they decided wow. that it was kind of boring. So yeah. he like they called the fire. I think it was a fire station. They called the fire station to ask them what temperature paper burns at. So they were like, the, at least the story goes that the person he spoke to was like, I'm not sure. So they went out and they like tried it <laughs> and oh. they came back and gave him the 451 answer. Okay. Yeah, that's, I think it's a really cool title. I like mm -hmm. it a lot. Okay, but that was yours. Hmm? I was trying to trick you on 1984 mm -hmm. because I thought 2 plus 2 equals 5 would actually be a cool title for that. Yeah. Book. Although it would be cryptic. But on the other hand, 1984 doesn't tell you anything. I just, you know that one I felt like I could get only because... But again, I it was sort of... A, I mean, it was still a guess because that could have been a draft title. But the reason I felt like it made sense to me that it wouldn't be the final title, even though it would have been an interesting one and would have fit, was yeah. just because that felt like too long to spit out for a title of a book, That's which doesn't- there might, there might even, I mean, I I didn't, I made it up entirely as far well, as, yeah. but, it, but it occurs to me, I was thinking it would look cool in numbers, mm -hmm. but then in libraries and other situations, if you had to spell out that whole, well, actually that's true with 1984, if you, mm. You know, at, a, at the library, it, it, they might spell it out, mm -hmm. which is awkward with numbers. With the larger yeah. they, you know, I out. didn't even think about the two plus two equals five as like the title with numbers. That Okay, I take it back. That would have been cool. It would but look I cool still got it. Because right. anybody would look at it and go like, what the hell is that about? Mm. You know? But yeah, I actually really like it because thematically it works so well because of the, like, what is it? What is the concept in that book? It's not false speak. Double speak? Double, double think? Double thing, I think you're, yeah, I was just like, yeah. yeah, I was like, war is peace. And there's, you know, and then um, there was a famous, there was a really cool Star Trek episode mm. with Captain Picard. Mm. He was captured by somebody. <clears throat> and the person was working on him, a la 1984, to try mm. to break him. And there was all these sessions where he was being tortured psychologically or whatever. And at the very end, he gets rescued. And this the guy was going like, I think they even used, they might have even used that two plus two equals five or something mm -hmm. like that. And Picard is just kind of in a, you know, he gets rescued. And then he says to somebody later, I was ready, I had broken, I was going to agree that I could see that was the answer. You know what I mean? Like it was huh. a real powerful scene. Like he he felt as broken as the guy in 1984. 1984. But he got rescued and went on about his merry way it, the more i hear about um star trek the more i realize how much thought they put into at least the original series like the original run of the series because there's a youtuber i watch who's a really big fan of star trek and she brings up episodes from that from time to time and i'm always like yeah. wow yeah, that's actually a surprisingly deep show i always thought yeah, it was sort of like i think there was a tremendous number of them bo both with the original series and with the picard series <clears throat> they, had, they had one in the original series where there was a, a guy, a famous actor, his name I can't come up with at the moment, but he played a man who's, he had a twin brother, mm -hmm. or less, but they were they were constantly fighting. One of them, like their face, their coloring was divided right down the middle. One was <laughs> black and white, and the other was white and black. Huh. And they were, you know, when somebody's going, what is your problem? And you go, look at him, look at how ugly he is, or whatever. 
And they're going, he looks just like you. He goes, what? Look. And it was like, because he's reversed. Uh-huh. It, it, it blew each of their minds of like how horrible the other person was. You know, <laughs> it sounds absurd. And it was maybe a little bit absurd, but they would use really interesting ways to explore things that are val valid and valuable. Mm -hmm. It was a good show. Yeah. Huh. So getting back to your question, okay, so I got the first one right about which one is true about Great Gatsby. Okay, so the other one. Can you give me the other two again? Yeah. yeah. It, it was Lord of the Flies originally be, going to be called Strangers from Within and was Catcher in the Rye originally be, going to be called A Bite of the Apple? Good question. Um. I like the title of Bite of the Apple. I understand why it would be called that. <sighs> Strangers from Within. Catcher in the Rye, oh, in the Rye. Lord of the Flies is a much better title, but that doesn't mean they didn't have one that wasn't as good. I'm gonna say because I like the title of Bite of the Apple better, not better, well, I like that title. I'm going to say that that must be false because that's a pretty good title. I don't know why they would change it. You're correct. Woo! I made it up. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was a good title too for Catcher in the Rye. Yeah, because Strangers from Within is a much weaker title than... Yeah, Lord of the Flies is a great title. Mm -hmm. I, think. I mean, especially given the appearance of evil as a swarm of flies. I am... Very sorry, we did not read that book when I was in high school because I feel like there were books we did read that that would have replaced. It would have been much better. Like we read The Crucible, and I yeah. feel like we should have read that instead. Yeah, not that The Crucible is bad. A lot of I think William Golding got the Nobel Prize, as a matter of fact, maybe. and a lot of people thought it was not deserved. Like he was, he was a, you know, a also, what do you call it? A, a lightweight compared yeah. to Thomas Mann and stuff like that. But I think he's really has a huge range of things that he did. And I thought he did them really well. I, I've read maybe five of his books altogether. Oh. I've only read the one, but I it really stuck with me. I mean, and I read it as an adult. So it's not like it stuck with me because I read it in school it was, or, or, and then studied it or something. It was just the imagery in that and the, the certain scenes in that, like when when Piggy like falls off and cracks his head open on the rock. I mean, that was so mm -hmm. vivid in my mind. Or when the other one um, went off and kind of like thought he like was dying and was like hallucinating off in the woods, yeah, that yeah. that's very vivid in my memory as well. I've yeah. never, I don't even, I guess there's a film adaptation. I've never seen it, so I've only well, ever. There's actually two two times it's been filmed. I'm pretty sure. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I um, so, that's a book I'd like to go back and read, especially mm -hmm. before I would see a film of it. I'd like to kind of re-experience my own sense of it. One time yeah. I picked, I I read the beginning and I thought, wow, I don't remember this very lush description of the island mm -hmm. and the water, you know, the water in the trees and all this stuff going on. And I just thought, boy, this is really denser than I, you know, I mean, I, a lot of times you wind up with that stick figure, like mm -hmm. stream version of the story in your mind. And I go, boy, this is a book to really get involved in. But, oh yeah, absolutely. I was gonna say another image from that that really stuck with me was um, the, I guess it's like the dead body of the not paratrooper but um with a oh. parachute yeah like, yeah yeah the guy who parachuted out book? yeah was that in that book they found yeah i'm okay. pretty sure i i, I i'm almost positive of it because i, I like, was that the point where the boy who eventually i think is killed by the rest yeah. of them he's by himself and yeah. he's contemplating that body that and i think yeah. there's, maybe that's where there's that mysterious moment where there's it's almost like the devil is talking to him or something. Yeah, like he's a mystical yes. kid. Mm -hmm. or, you know, he seems to be subtlety of mind. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, yeah. That whole I did. Yeah, I would reread that. I should reread that too. Actually, I that yeah. was it's a very, very vivid, visceral book for what it is. Yeah. I feel like really good book. But yeah, the that original that other title you said is just yeah not as good as the Lord of the Flies. I'm glad, they, I'm glad they got that better title for it. I do like the bite of the apple, though. I think that's very good. Well done. <laughs> well done, you. 
I don't know if I would have liked it better if that were the title, but because I just don't like that book. Yeah, but the, other, like... the, other, the, t- the other title is like unique and very memorable mm-hmm. and, and from a strange little story in the book. Mm-hmm. As far as, you know, the, Col- Holden Caulfield having this kind of weird image. It reminded me of um, Silence of the Lambs. Yes. Where, where Clarice, whatever, tells the guy that story about the lamb. Mm-hmm. She, went to, she ran away with the lamb to save mm-hmm. it and she got so tired and it was so heavy and all this. It was very much like, you know, I wanted to just save one thing, you know. Yeah. Like catch her in a ride. And yeah. Huh. I'm hearing a squeaking back here from the cats. <laughs> yeah, sure. I don't know what they want. I maybe Mama Cat wants to be freed up from her kids. I don't I, know. I'm not sure what I want to do about that. So I'll postpone my decision. <laughs> Okay, well, I've got one more for you. Okay. So all of these are about Shakespeare. Uh-oh. Hmm. Not okay. Not nice but okay. <laughs> okay, good. Maybe I have a chance. <laughs> okay, uh, number one. Oscar Wilde wrote a mystery short story about Shakespeare. Two. Dostoevsky heavily criticized Shakespeare and claimed he was not a true artist. Hmm. And three. The Two Gentlemen of Verona is the lowest rated book on Goodreads, but or lowest rated play by Shakespeare on Goodreads. Two Gentlemen of Verona. Oh. Boy, those are really all over the map. Let me think here. I think Oscar Wilde would be perfectly capable of writing a story about hmm. Shakespeare, or however you put that. Hmm. I, I, um, the Dostoevsky one is tempting for a a reason that's pretty stupid, but um, there's a famous thing of the hedgehog and the fox. Mm. Which means for people who are profound in in the depth of one thing would be the hedgehog, and the mm-hmm. fox is like master of, you know, many you know uh, jack mm-hmm. of all trades kind of a thing. And in that lineup, Dostoevsky falls on the side of the hedgehog, and Shakespeare's on the side of the Fox. <laughs> so it could be that by personality he would find the other guy not repulsive necessarily, but sounds a little bit like that. If if that one is true, I'm going to just go with that one. You're going to say that's true or that's false? Yeah, that Dostoevsky disliked Shakespeare. Yes, that's. Oh no, no, sorry, that's false. That's the false one. Oh okay. Oh wait, so it, it's not true. No, Wait a I'm confused. I, I was I was saying it was <laughs> true, so I'm wrong. <laughs> yes, you're I wrong. The false one as true. Yeah, okay. that's false. So okay. in fact, Dostoevsky. I don't know what Dostoevsky felt about him, but Tolstoy famously really disliked Shakespeare. Okay. Apparently, I was reading quite a bit about that. He really dragged Shakespeare through the mud pretty publicly apparently so his whole thing was that not only did he think that um shakespeare was not a true artist but he felt like the only reason anybody cared about him at all or he was propped up as being important was because of german propaganda why german propaganda i didn't read deeply enough to know but like anyway like that was his feeling about it and that was where that was his stance and dostoevsky Okay. Seemed like from what I could read, because I was trying to see if either one of them had any strong feelings about him. And Dostoevsky is what I could find that he ever said about Shakespeare sounded like neutral positive. And then like Tolstoy was like top. Yeah. And when I okay. looked well, up I famous authors who hated Shakespeare, to know. Huh. yeah, he was like number one anti Shakespeare club. Um, yeah, no, he did not. And then uh, not Dostoevsky. Oscar Wilde did indeed write. I think calling it a mystery, I nobody ever called it a mystery, but it is a mystery. He did write a short story called The Portrait of Mr. W.H. That okay. was about, uh, if you ever heard of that one? No, W.H., not W.S. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, because it's 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 about Shakespeare, but that was, I, this is a slightly unfair way that I wrote this question a little bit, but like, it is about Shakespeare. So essentially, he wrote this short story um, about this mystery surrounding the like who Shakespeare dedicated his sonnets to Uh, so there's this if you've heard of this yeah there was some ambiguity about 
whether it was a woman w- or a man. Yes, about who W.H. was in the dedication to the sonnets. And Oscar Wilde wrote this short story mystery thing that was about the idea that it was this actor, like a boy actor in the troupe called Willie Hughes, Hayes, Hughes, and um, that that was who it was dedicated to. And so within his short story, the protagonist is trying to like find proof of this. Okay. And that's like what the story is about. That's interesting. Mm-hmm. Huh. And then, <laughs> yeah, so there you go. There's our, there's our Shakespeare good, trivia. Good, good trickery on your part. I thought that was my best one. I, I saved that for last because I was pretty proud of those, but I also felt like it was a high risk, high reward because I was like, well, if Dean knows that story by Oscar Wilde, that doesn't work. And you no. might have known the the Dostoevsky thing. So I was like, well, no, no, you, you really got me on that one. I, well, I, I went off onto the, you know, like a, as though it were a mathematical thing of like, since, mm. since this guy is put on that side of the fence, he has to dislike the other guy. Well, you have to guess from something. So like, oh, I yeah, think that's exactly. I thought, and then I you got one I thought my yeah. logic was good, but it was wrong. <laughs> well, it wasn't. It wasn't true of your question. Okay, I've got a couple of more. You want me to hit you with them? Yeah, go for it. They're really. They're, this one's really all over the map. So ready? Okay. Saul Bellow was born in Canada. Hmm. Margaret Atwood invented a device for remote robotic writing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Norman Miller wore a wig. <laughs> um, what's your Norman name? Willer wearing a wig sounds believable to me. Not because like I have a strong picture of what he looks like, but that just seems like okay, yeah, that could be. Why not? Let let the lad wear a wig. Saul Bellow is born in Canada. I feel like that could also be true, only because I feel like so many people were randomly born in Canada that I just assumed were American. Sorry, Canadians, but sometimes one does that. Um but then again, the Margaret Atwood thing is so bizarre that I assume that must be true. I'm going to say that's true about Margaret Atwood. You are right. <laughs> very that's weird. But true, very right? weird. I have to look into that further. That's a speech. <laughs> Margaret Atwood invented a device for remote robotic writing. I mean, I guess there are some, speaking of Canadian writers, who would say, is there anything she, the woman can't do? So there's that. But like, oh my God, cultural icon. <laughs> Saul Bella. Ah. I'm usually wrong about things like this, so I'm just going to hedge my bets here and say Saul Bellow was born in Canada. I'll say that. So I'll say that the wig one is not true. You are right. You win. Really? I circled the, I circled the one that was false. Okay. <laughs> that was a better system than what I did. I had to create a number. So that I would remember. <laughs> I forgot. Also, to make sure I had a false one in there, I had, you know, mm-hmm. like I don't want to start reading and go, wait a minute, never mind, these are all true. Never mind, these are all true. Okay, so Saul Bellow is Canadian then, technically. Yeah, he, well, he was born in Canada. He's famous, yeah. very famous Chicago writer. Also, that's why I thought it must be true because I that's the that's the type of thing that I always get backwards is like every, I, every not I can't even think of an example, but it's happened to me several times where whether it's like an author or a musician or something. And I'll just assume that they're American because that's either what I know them for or what they're writing or singing about feels like it could be a American. Mm-hmm. And then it'll be like, oh, they're Canadian. And I'm like, okay. So yeah, Canada, okay. Canada has a, has a in my, in my mm-hmm. mind, a reputation for having disproportionate contribution of artists, you know, musicians. All the population. Writers, yeah. Yeah, yeah, for the population. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a lot of also with Canada, what's interesting, I think about, especially like literature in Canada is that because they have such a mm, like high immigrant population, like recent, recently immigrated, like a recently immigrated population, like so many of their authors were born or grew up somewhere else and then moved to Canada. But Canada, at least it seems to me in the way that they're publishing industry works here in in any case is they seem to embrace these people as Canadian authors regardless of the age at which the person moved to Canada so there are quite a few um, authors that are considered Canadian authors who were teenagers or older when they moved to Canada but they're still considered Canadian which I find interesting 
and and I think to a degree they consider themselves Canadian too. Yeah, like I'm pretty I, sure. I like, I like that system better than the than the one that's sort of anecdotal. But somebody like you know they live in Texas for fifteen mm -hmm. years, and somebody goes like, "I'm a Texan." You go, "Well, not really. I mean, you you you're from Idaho, or you know whatever." Yeah. But they make it seem as though like if you weren't born here, you're not really. Blah, 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 which it is gets a, complicated. It's a stupid attitude. I, I like yeah. the idea that you can, you know, it's sort of like like an adoption thing. You'd go mm -hmm. like, "Well, these aren't my real parents." You'd go, "Well, that's bullshit. They, they're they're your parents." Yeah. Well, a lot of these that's, things seem like concerned about where you, who bore you to the world, yeah. but, but who raised you or whatever. Well, so it yeah. kind of comes down to like the utility question, right? Because like, for example, I have a really good example of this. It's not a writer, unfortunately, that would fit the theme better. But this, I think, is the best example I can think of of this, where it's like the utility of saying one identity over the other is so obvious. So there's this really popular YouTuber called Dr. Mike, and uh, who is a medical doctor who makes okay. medical doctor content on YouTube. Very, very popular. Did a very cool uh, TED talk, actually. Anyway, but like he was born in Russia, technically, but he came to the U.S. when he was under the age of five and then like never went back to Russia, to my knowledge. And to me, it's like, Oh, so he's American. And I think most people, I think he even says of himself most of the time, like he refers to himself not as like, I'm an American, but like in, in such a way where it's like so obvious that that's the culture of his upbringing, that it like it would be an after like a, a trivia thing to be like, oh, yeah, and my family is like from Russia. Right. But you would put it that way if you were that person, I think, most of the time. Right. And I and to me, it's like the utility of saying like that. The utility is this guy is American. Who he was born in Russia, like to say this guy is Russian to me has less utility because it's like Russian in what way? Like yeah, you know, it's, by it's blood? Completely misleading for who they are. Yeah, somewhat. And yeah. I know that's a sort of a line in the sand that's up for that individual person to kind of draw, obviously. But speaking in the abstract, I think you can sort of draw those lines in ways that are that that, that come down to utility. Like, I've spent the last roughly 10 years of my life not living in the U.S., right? So essentially, my entire adult life did not live in the U.S. However, but and also, I would still say it would be ridiculous of me to say I'm not American because of this, even if my attachment to, like, how America has culturally shifted in the last 10 years is a little off. Like, that was the country of my upbringing. Like, a lot of my identity was shaped by having grown up in the U.S. So... I, I maybe at some point, if I end up living somewhere else for a longer period of time than I lived in the U.S., I would switch that idea. But I think for me, the utility is like the culture of my upbringing, because I think that's the part that in my mind shaped a lot of who I became later. Yeah, so, that's on a bigger scale and a mm -hmm. more significant scale. But mm -hmm. you could almost use me as a parallel story of saying I've lived in a bunch of places around the country. I've lived in Michigan so long mm -hmm. that it's only for the sake of an anecdote or something that I would bring up anything else. But when I first came to Michigan, if somebody said something like, you know, and then they named something that was local, like Meyer or something like mm -hmm. that, to that, they'd go like, where are you from? You know what I mean? Like, it doesn't have to be Russia. It could just be Texas or California. Yeah. To be, it's kind of like, until I, guess you, I, until you, you, I guess you acclimatize. Mm-hmm. And yeah, because identity is just such a, I think, more malleable thing than people realize and so much of a more subjective thing than I think people realize. And also like the way that other identities intersect with that in a way that determines how you identify yourself makes a huge difference too. Like right. I, I know like like Kazuo Ishiguro, for example, I think it would be like ridiculous not to say that he's like a British author, right? Like right. he writes about British identity primarily. Like he grew up there largely, I think. Like I think he was pretty young when he was there, if I'm not mistaken. But yeah, regardless, I think that, Yeah. But regardless, yeah. like of when he moved there, like he I, I think it would be absurd not to say, like, oh yeah, that's a British author. Right, the fact right. that his but, family but, is but on Japanese. the surface, if, if a person wasn't familiar with him and they heard the name, yeah. they'd go, Oh, is this a Japanese fellow or whatever? Mm -hmm. you know? And they'd go, And it's well, interesting. His cultural is his, his family background is Japanese but well 
And I think that a lot of that comes, and then this is like sort of off topic, but like, but I think the Saul Bellow thing kind of is revealing of this in a way where it's like, I mean, to be fair, Canada and the US are culturally, again, sorry, Canada, but like sort of similar, especially along like the border states and provinces, like in that strip, like culturally so similar that it's it's less of a stretch to be like, oh, they're Canadian. Okay. But like, I imagine, for instance, if you had a person who grew up in a town, like a border town in, in the American South, and they had like a, a Hispanic last name, for example, like Gomez, let's say, like, I feel like if a person saw their name on a book, and they and they didn't, they just thought, oh, this is like a Hispanic author. But let's say this person doesn't speak Spanish, has never been to Mexico, but like that's where their family is from, like one or two generations back, whatever. Like to me, I would be like, well, do they identify as American? Because if they do, like, yes. But on the other hand, I think that there would be less of a, oh, okay, he's American, than there would be for like Saul Bella, oh, okay, he's Canadian, just because the person's not white, honestly. Yeah. I feel like mm-hmm. there's less of an acceptance of like being part of the hegemonic I, the, like oh, uh, totally, cultural totally identity. Totally. And I, I think that probably influences a lot, or it could influence like how a person is writing or what they're writing about, but I don't think it has to. Like Kazuo Ishiguro, it certainly doesn't seem to influence what he's writing about. No, that's, but, a, that's a good example. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting. Okay, I've got one more and then we can okay. go on to our other yes. section. Sure. Um, this is a more bizarre than the rest of them. Oh my God, okay. Okay. Which word is made up? And I'll tell you the word and the meaning. Okay. Obelist, a person of little or no value. Okay. Anatiferous, producing ducks. <laughs> Haplography, the inadvertent writing once what should have been written twice. <laughs> I do that, certainly. Um, can you read the... F- okay, first of all, when you say made up, like made up by you? No, but, but not considered to be a legitimate word. Someone okay. just made it up. Like, okay. there was a kid's book called Frindle. Oh, yes, I know that one. Where a kid in the school goes like, hey, let's start calling these things Frindles. Mm-hmm. And then he tried to get everybody on board to, like, change the way the world was or something. I, I never read the book. but So I mean it in that sense. I mean, not not like as a card table joke. Yeah. But a, a writer used it in a book, but it was a made uh, up word. By gotcha. Okay. Okay. Can you read me the first one again? Obelist, O B E L I S T. Okay. A person of little or no value. Um, Anatiferous, mm-hmm. producing ducks. And haplography, the inadvertent writing once what should have been written twice. I'm going to say that one's a real word. The third one. Is that true? That's a real word or no? Yes, it is. Okay. My thought for that was, well, it is strange, but it's one of those, the reason I picked that one is because I thought, okay, if we're talking about a writer made this up, I couldn't, unless they were writing nonfiction, I don't know why you would make that up because a descriptor seems more like something you would use in like a novel. That's a good, that's a good point. That is a weakness of that one. I have, I actually had down below, I have like five other words oh my God. in this thing. I'll tell you about them in a minute, but. Okay. And then, okay. Over. So, Anatiferous or obelisk? The duck one is so specific that I just feel like that must exist outside of this. Okay, I'm going to just, I'm just, I'm not going to overthink it either. I'm going to say the first one is the one that somebody made up, like an author made that up. You are right. You're right. Yeah. There's a mystery writer. I, I don't, I didn't keep all my information here, but I think it should, obelisks, something, something is the title of his book. Huh. And whenever, whenever I stumbled on that, it, it was specifically said that this is a word he made up, and he even changed the meaning of it within his story. Oh <laughs> but how about some other words? I give you some other uh-huh. ones too. By the way, uh, anatiferous meaning producing ducks sounds like that's sounds like a comedy. Joke. Yeah. Like, how could there be such a word? Well, apparently in the past, people believed that a certain um, substance that was in a swampy thing or like a mm. pond or whatever was some sort of algae or whatever 
was the source of ducks, like ducks were created from this situation. You know, so they, so they, <laughs> there was a technical term for <laughs> where ducks came from, sort of, I don't know. But, it, but, but it's literally called producing ducks. Okay, here's That's another one. Um, uh -huh. Add satitious. Uh, that which is taken to complete something else, though originally it was extrinsic, supplemental, and additional, but it slowly went from being additional to being essential to the completing something. <laughs> add oh, satitious. Okay. Here's, here's another one that I, I actually meant to substitute this instead of antiphorous because I thought uh -huh. that was absurd. Valgus, V, V, you know, V, uh -huh. A, L, G, U, S, bow legged, uh -huh. <laughs> or more mops is a species of bat. That's uh, my favorite word, more mops. More mops, isn't that a great word? Proficuous, <laughs> advantageous, or useful. <laughs> and uh, foraminous, foraminous, F O R A M I N O S. Full of holes, perforated in many places, porous. I think that's a what's cool that one, one again? Forami foraminous. I wonder if that's part of. I, ooh, no, it's not, but it should be. The, there, the reason I ask is because there's a phobia word, I, but I think it's called scopophobe. No, that's something different. Anyway, like there's this uh, phobia that involves that idea of things that have a lot of holes in them, and the only oh. reason I have ever heard of this is because there's this famous of course do I know their name do I know the name of the manga I don't but like there's this famous horror mangaka who did a collection of stories about that idea so like wherein that happens somehow I didn't read it so I don't know exactly but I've seen like pictures of some of this is really creepy but it'll be this idea of like okay yeah I actually I actually as a child I would say <clears throat> I had some vague I, I don't know if you call it a fear or like mm. a um image that would disturb me like if i were mm -hmm. dreaming and, I, and there's some image of something being full of holes like a beehive kind of thing or something yeah um but i but i was thinking that might be a cool word to start to try to work into something to mean like this story isn't holding up. It's it's foraminous, you know. Foraminous. <laughs> I, yes, that's a much more. What does that mean? I go get your dictionary out. Ooh, which is that's a much more cheerful one. One of the books I would like to recommend. Well, I was going to say. So let's get into that. So why don't you go first with your dictionary? 